Next on KQED Newsroom, Caltrans under scrutiny again this week amid ongoing concerns over the new Bay Bridge span. A criminal investigation of a Petaluma slaughterhouse puts local ranchers at risk. Plus, a high-tech lifeline teaching computer code to give black youth better opportunities. We need coders, we need designers, we need a lot of people. Good evening and welcome to KQED Newsroom. I'm Tui Vu. With continuing criticism surrounding the new eastern span of the Bay Bridge, Caltrans said that it would address some of the doubts about the bolts and rods raised by critics. At a hearing this week, Caltrans officials said the agency is doing further testing. Additional questions have been raised about misaligned road deck sections and leaks and possible corrosion from rain. Joining me now for a closer look at safety issues and what happens next are... Charles Pillar, Sacramento Bee senior writer. Jackson Vanderbecken, San Francisco Chronicle reporter. State Senator Mark DeSonier of Concord. And Brian Moroni, Chief Bridge Design Engineer for Caltrans, joining us from Sacramento. Mr. Moroni, let me begin with you. Uh, as you know, there have been a number of questions about the materials and the construction methods for the Bay Bridge. How are you addressing these concerns? Well, what we're doing is we're trying to um, go to extraordinary um, lengths to make sure we reach out to the public um, to communicate what we've actually done. In the original planning um, stages where we reached out to the public following NEPA, National, Envir Pro um, National Environmental Policy Act, where the community chose the kind of bridge that they wanted, um, um, the kind of engineering that was involved in the design that the community chose, um, the kind of engineering and construction that was necessary uh, in the construction stages for that bridge. And then even we're now starting to talk about what kind of um, maintenance and operations we're going to be um, needing to do for the next 150 years. And actually, just, uh, just two nights ago, we had a public meeting where we invited the public and any, uh, any other interested parties, invited guests, to just talk about, um, talk about the A354 BD bolts. So you're trying um, to too. excuse me for interrupting. So you're, you're trying to engage the public more, but specifically, what kinds of testing and what kinds of repairs are you uh, making? And and can you tell the public at this point that this bridge, which has cost 6.4 billion dollars, is supposed to last 150 years? Can you tell the public at this point that it will indeed hold up and be safe if we have a big earthquake? I feel very comfortable about that. Um, you know, there are no promises in a major earthquake. I mean, any, any real bridge engineer, you know, th there are no promises in an earthquake. But we have gone to uh, lengths that are way beyond the standards of California, way beyond the standards in the United States. Um, we didn't just design for a thousand year um, set of ground motions, a thousand year earthquake. We designed for a 1500 year um, ground motion, which is above and beyond. And we didn't just design for the standards um, that is no collapse um, after a big earthquake. We actually designed for this bridge to be operational. Now it'll still have some concrete that's cracked and spalled, it'll still have some steel that's bent, it'll still have some repair that's necessary, but I believe we, uh, we are going to be able to get low boy tractor trailer rigs, fire trucks, water trucks across this bridge. Um, uh, reasonably quickly we'll be able to get people going back and forth across the bridge so the Bay Area can start to reconstruct itself after a major earthquake and this is the first bridge that's been elevated to this level and it all goes back to Loma Prieta where um, the governor's board of inquiry challenged the governor to make this bridge something more and the governor put out an executive directive saying uh, let's have the first bridge that's a lifeline bridge where afterwards we're not thinking about just no collapse we're thinking about let's make it um, operational uh, after an event so I, I'm, I'm really excited that this team has taken that challenge on. So I feel, um, I feel very good about what we've done. Now I also want to say, you know, in, in the real world, anytime you build anything, there's no such thing as, as perfection. There's no such thing as 100%. I think there's been some misunderstanding about, about something being perfect. Anytime you do a billion things, there are going to be a few challenges. And, and of course, that's practical. And we're, we, are, we are addressing those things. But I still feel this bridge is sound. It's very good. The public can be very proud of it. And it's, it's, as, as I've worked from San Diego to Crescent City. 
this is the most fantastic bridge um, that I've seen from San Diego to Crescent City. Let me bring in Charles Pillar, uh, investigative reporter at the Sacramento Bee at this point, because you've been covering the Bay Bridge yes. and all the issues that have come up for the, uh, for the past several years now. What do you make of what uh, Brian Maroney just said? And um, you were at the Caltrans technical briefing this week. What are you hearing in terms of reaction from engineers outside Caltrans? Well, I want to commend Caltrans for this technical briefing in one respect. What was interesting about it is that for the first time they accepted outside criticism as having considerable validity about the concerns about the high strength anchor rods and bolts on the bridge. And what it means is that they're showing a degree of openness to reconsidering their hidebound positions on these kinds of matters and letting outside experts who are quite brilliant in their own right have an opportunity to state their case. I think the next question for Caltrans in this regard, particularly with the bolts, is will they allow outside people to also perform tests to get an independent review of what Caltrans is always very reassuring in the comments that they make about the validity of their tests and about the stability of the structure. And I think that's great that they feel so confident in it. If they're so confident, why not release samples of these bolts to the independent engineers who've requested them so that these kinds of tests can be done independently and new tests that might give the public an extra measure of reassurance about how great that structure really is. Well, since we have the chief engineer for the Bay Bridge here with Caltrans, Brian Maroney, do you want to take a second to answer that? Why not have outside folks test uh, the bolts and rods? Well, I'm not in a position to you know, give away state property. However, um, I think we've been really open to inviting everybody in to come in and, and review our data, and I hope, I hope we'll continue to do that. I certainly will be uh, a full participant of making sure everybody gets a chance to see everything we're doing. Um, uh, again, I think we've been open, and I'm willing to continue to be open. If, if we transfer material to other agencies or other groups, that's something that probably the Toll Bridge Program Oversight Committee We'll have to evaluate. Will but, you uh, encourage I'm 100 percent. I'm 100 percent open to any kind of review. Uh, it's a it's a public bridge, and I believe the public should get a chance to see and and uh, understand everything. Uh, Jackson, you uh, you <coughs> you had a report this week talking about misaligned steel sections. Can you explain what you found? What happened was that when they made these giant steel hulls and ship them from China. They fit together one way in China, and when they arrived here, they fit together in a different way. The top, the long plane where the deck is, where people drive over, there were dips, valleys, small by proportion to the thickness of the steel, as much as half, however. So this thick steel is 14 millimeters. This was as much as eight, so it's almost half. And what happens is you have to fabricate a weld a different way and that weld can be a problem and what happened was is that the chief designer of the bridge gave a briefing to Caltrans back in 2010 in which he said that in a major earthquake a seismic event like the type that Brian was talking about you could have areas of local failure in these misaligned sections now that doesn't mean the bridge is going to fall down but the question was you know why would you accept this material that would <clears throat> bake in additional failures that aren't necessary considering there are a number of failures that they anticipate going to happen in an earthquake so that's where this was the question is why would you accept this material it wasn't acceptable under Caltrans's standards it wasn't acceptable under welding society bridge code there's all these different rules that say you can't do this it has a number of risks but the significant risk was a seismic one and senator Desonia, you are uh, head of uh, the senate transportation mm -hmm. and housing committee investigating all this are you asking the same questions, and what's the status of your investigation it, now? It's ongoing. Uh, we had hoped to be done by now, but we keep finding more and more. We keep getting more people coming forward and giving us information. So with all due respect to Mr. Maroney, who I do have a lot of respect for, and Brian and I have a lot of history on this bridge, um, I don't think it's been as open as it should have been. And uh, clearly there were mistakes made. Uh, the bridge is 10 years late opening. It was $5 billion more than it was supposed to be when I voted for it when I was on MTC. And we continue to have all these other issues about his durability. So I, I know that Brian try, did his best. He's uh, 
he's great at what he does, but clearly there are mistakes made, and we want to learn from those mistakes. In fact, you were the tiebreaker vote on the MTC, the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, when it approved the design for this new eastern span. If you had to do it all over again, would you do anything differently? Uh, well, it, it was a subcommittee of MTC, and I was one of the members, and there was a, there was a professional group giving us advice. Um, I, I think the design was a mistake. I think it was, it's a beautiful bridge, but clearly we tried to do something aspirational that had never been done, as Brian said, you know, of its type, and I think we could have done just as well if we were able to do, say, a cable stay. Or uh, perhaps retrofit the old Bay Bridge? Do you think that would have been better than the new design? I don't know. I mean, we were presented with that. We were given specific uh, cost estimates of what it would do for that and what we would get if we built this bridge. Um, it's hindsight's 2020. I just think the design drove a lot of the things that have resulted in uh, a lot of innovation, but a lot of risk as well. And, and Brian Maroney, I'll ask you the same question. If you could do this all over again, would you do anything differently? Well, I, I feel very good about what, um, what um, uh, Director Van Lobenselves um, did many, many years ago. He was a great leader. Um, he, uh, I gave him advice about um, you know, a fantastic um, box girder bridge. We called it the Skyway. Uh, we suggested parallel um, uh, single level structures. And it was potentially, I believe, going to be about the same price as retrofit of the old bridge, as well as something that would perform much, much better. But again, following the National Environmental Policy Act, which is federal law, and we have to, we reach out to the community, we ask the community what they want. And that includes a lot of people that have a lot of complex values. You know, um, uh, many people were involved. I don't want to name names. But uh, I, I agree with Senator, the senator. I, I, think he, I think his perspective is exactly right, and he and I have been on this from the very beginning. Um, uh, the community chose a fantastic bridge. They challenged me and my team and, and the senator, and we put our shoulder to it, and we did, uh, we did the very best job that we could have done. We've got a great bridge. It is over, uh, it is, uh, over cost. It has taken too long, and I'll be the first person to say that. Now, I, I completely agree with the senator on that. Um, but uh, you know, I still feel that, as I understand it, uh, Mary King and others taught me we need to follow what the community wants. And as an engineer, I'm a bridge engineer. I do, um, I do what the community and elected officials ask me and challenge me to do to the best of my ability. And Senator DeSonia, just real quickly, um, March 4th, Caltrans has to give the MTC a full accounting of any construction defects, flaws, and irregularities. And you have uh, some legislation you're working on? We'll work, we're working as part of our uh, investigation. And this year, I anticipate that there'll be a bipartisan effort on a series of bills from the lessons we learned from both MTC's investigation and ours. All right. Well, I thank do you want to make all. sure it's. I do want to make sure it's clear that um, that uh, at least me and my team, we are absolutely going to support um, the senator in his effort, 110 percent. And uh, with the issue that uh, Jackson brought up, um, and he has identified um, a, a potential discussion between um, uh, Marwan Nader and myself. Um, I feel very, very comfortable about it, uh, about my decision, and I feel uh, we looked at okay. uh, outside experts, uh, verified it, and the public can be very confident in the safety of this bridge, its performance every day, as well as in a large earthquake. Okay, Brian Maroney, we're going to have to leave it there and give you the last word on that. Brian Maroney with Caltrans, Charles Piller, Senator Mark DeSonier, and Jackson Vanderbeck, and thank you all for being here. Thank you. And coming up, a look at how learning computer code could lead to social change. But first, local ranchers are feeling the squeeze from a criminal investigation of a Petaluma slaughterhouse. Rancho Feeding Corporation is under fire for processing diseased animals. The issue is renewing concerns about food safety and raising questions about the role of government inspectors. Meanwhile, Bay Area cattle producers are left without a local facility to process their meat. KQED News reporter Bina Kim has been covering the story. She spoke with Scott Schaefer earlier today. Mina Kim, this started off as a rather limited investigation. We're now looking at a whole year's worth of beef processed at this plant being recalled. What's the latest on this USDA investigation and a potential impact of it? 
So, right, this recall of nearly 9 million pounds of beef happened about three weeks ago when a Petaluma slaughterhouse, Rancho Feeding Corporation, said that it would need to recall this amount of beef that had been processed over the course of an entire year, as you said, because USDA officials said that diseased animals may have uh, been processed at this plant. But that sparked a lot of questions because by law, USDA inspectors are supposed to be there whenever any processing is taking place. So how is it possible that diseased animals move through this facility without the required inspection. Now, earlier this week, the Press Democrat reported that an inspector actually uh, tried to flag problems at the USDA plant and was ignored. Uh, we talked with USDA inspectors. They wouldn't say much about the investigation, but they did send us a statement saying that they believe rancho owners, they're investigating rancho owners for possibly circumventing inspections and that they don't feel that this recall in any way reflects any failures on USDA's part. But of course, we don't know the results of the investigation. Quite right, yet. it's ongoing. So the rancho slaughterhouse is shut down. Uh, and so what impact is that having on ranchers, especially those in Northern California? This is the only slaughterhouse in the San Francisco Bay Area. So that means ranchers right now are driving either to Eureka, they're driving to Los Banos to get their meat processed. So they're going and, with, with live cattle. Yes, and it takes hours. So that is not an insignificant cost. And then when you couple that with the drought, they're actually being hit with feeding costs because there is enough rain to grow their own grass, for example. They're getting hit on many sides. The other way that the these ranchers are being hit is that some of them have meat tied up in this recall that they processed at the plant during 2013 that they have frozen and we're hoping to sell. Now, no one has gotten sick that we know of because of meat processed at this plant. Uh, so why is it being held back or recalled and, uh, and, and where is it? Well, I spoke with Bill Nyman, who is one of the few people who has about 100,000 pounds of beef in cold storage. I um, mean, he's hoping to get that meat released. He's talking with the USDA about how the procedures uh, that his company uses to slaughter their cattle uh, make it impossible for it to have commingled with other meat at the facility. But most of it is not in cold storage. Most of it has already been consumed because it was processed over the course of a year. And of course, if people have products, there is actually a partial list on KQED's website at our on our news fix blog uh, of products that are being recalled. If they have those products, they can take them back to the store where they bought them and get a refund. Now you mentioned Bill Nyman, that's a, a grass fed operation, high end, many of the best restaurants in the Bay Area and, and uh, grocery stores sell that meat. Uh, what does it do to to them and a rep, the reputation that they've developed over all these years. Well, they're hoping to secure their reputation by getting their meat uh, released from the recall actively with the USDA. They're working with them to try to do that, but they could take up to a $400,000 hit if they can't get this meat sold during the course of this year. Now, interestingly, you know, rancho owners are not saying much, but one thing that an attorney for a rancho owner has come out and said is that they can guarantee that Nyman's beef is okay. Yeah, and so they're hoping that that gets resolved. Now, Rancho, as we said, is shut down, and there is a local buyer, Marin Sun Farms, which is trying to purchase the slaughterhouse. What would it mean? Who are they? Tell us a little bit about them, and what would it mean for them to take over? Well, Marin Sun Farms is a local Bay Area purveyor of high-end meats, and what it would mean if they do uh, successfully buy this plant, which I think the process is going well, um, is that they're going to be able to provide local ranchers who rely on the slaughterhouse for their business a means to continue their business and, and thrive. The other thing that Marintz on Farms has is that it has a facility where you can cut and wrap the meat and get it ready for sale, and it has a very robust distribution chain. So presumably, if uh, Marintz on Farms takes over, ranchers who use their facilities will be able to get their uh, you know, high-end meat to market, to restaurants, to stores faster, and maybe even more affordably. As so, well, in, in fact, in the end, it could be a very happy resolution, at least, at least from the point of view of these ranchers. Yeah, I guess if you're looking for a silver lining for this story, that's it. Yeah. In the meantime, vegetarianism looks pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> for some. Okay. Mina Kim, thanks so much. Thank you. On Thursday, President Obama announced a new initiative called My Brother's Keeper, aimed at helping young men of color succeed. And this is an issue of national importance. It is as important as any issue that I work on. It's an issue that goes to the very heart of why I ran for president. 
Among the community leaders advising the White House is Kalima Pryforce, head mentor at an Oakland-based nonprofit called the Hidden Genius Project. His group and others want to diversify the high-tech sector by preparing more African Americans for computer jobs. As Arthi Shanahani reports, the goal is to transform lives one keystroke at a time. Said after the position. Okay, okay. So these teenagers spend hours glued to their computer screens, but they're not playing games or doing their homework for that matter. They're studying something they're not taught at school: computer coding. Will be three. They're picking right. up Python and HTML5 and Ruby on Rails. John L. White is a sophomore at Vallejo High. It's a new language. It's like you learn, like you're learning Spanish, but you're learning something else other than Spanish. Letters and numbers and symbols. Repeat one more time for me. What this is the Hidden Genius Project, a small nonprofit that's working to recruit young black men into the high tech sector. It's one of the few parts of the economy that's booming and aching for diversity. Other people can help you make The boys classes. have to apply to the Sometimes program, and often, if accepted, they commit to classes twice a week in Oakland. Oh, Rihanna, hold the door, please, Rihanna. Brian McCuller is a sophomore at Salesian High School in Richmond. He'd hoped for a football career, then a knee injury put him on the sidelines. I didn't think I'd be doing anything in life, and this comes along, Hidden Genius Project, and it just, it just opened, I just saw it open doors for me. Brian lives with his grandparents, who really like what he's doing, but don't quite get it. Dolores Murray is his grandmother. I don't have any idea what coding is. <laughs> Murray does understand that it's a promising step. Instead of just playing video games, her grandson could end up making them for money. It has been a real good thing for a teenage young man who is trying to do the right thing. He's trying to stay out of the streets, trying to get good grades. He has all this going for him. The input and then Hidden Genius comes along and just kind of adds a little more gel to the pudding so that it, you know, it kind of sets. Here, use my iPad. Uh, okay. A few weekends ago, the Hidden Genius students spent three days working nonstop to build games and mobile apps. It was their very first hackathon, one for black male achievement. All right, guys, let's go. And behind it is Kalima Pryforce. Pryforce, now a tech entrepreneur, started in a very different place. He grew up in foster care. And while he found a way out, his little brother did not. The system reduced a lot of his opportunities to pursue his own dreams. He actually wanted to be a computer scientist. So he stayed in the group home system until he was 18, and then he aged out and he was killed a couple of months later. So that was when I decided that I would focus on becoming an educator. This was like the skeleton. Hackathons are about generating ideas and prototypes fast. The best ideas make it to market, but that's later. Today, the focus is on mobile apps that help teens deal with everyday problems, like what to eat and whether to show up to school. Brian and his group are working on a do-it-yourself adventure game about decision-making. Make that a little bit smaller. John L's team is creating a fitness app with a cartoon bird that gets slimmer the more the user exercises. How many should we do? One, I mean, I mean, one jumping jack? Five or ten. Each team has tech professionals coaching the students. So it was like, we need coders, we need designers, we need a lot of people. Oakland is a stone's throw away from Silicon Valley. And companies like the music streaming site Pandora have set up shop here. But Pryforce says while the community is largely African American, the startup workforce is not. Some of these kids, they can be considered misfits, they can be considered uh, disadvantaged and all these different weird terms. But I like to prefer to see them as low opportunity youth. And we are trailblazers. At the end of the weekend, each group pitches their ideas to each other. 12.5 million potential customers. And a panel of judges. How did you uh, reach out to uh, folks to get more input on the game? Hackathon funder Mitch Caper has invested over a million dollars in the Oakland startup scene this last year alone. He says the East Bay is full of untapped potential and maybe even the next billion dollar company. I've always been 
looking around corners. So when I got started in personal computers in 1978, nobody took them seriously. And when I started working on and investing in internet companies in 1993, nobody took it seriously, and so on. So this really isn't any different. Black and Latino kids spend plenty of time using technology. But the Hidden Genius Project wants to see consumers become producers and see that diversity reflected in high-tech products. Take violence on the streets. If we want to build an app that could have saved Trayvon Martin's life, one of the best approaches is to make sure that Trayvon Martin is able to build that app for the Trayvon Martin. What potential? As exciting as it is, a hackathon is short-lived. It'll take a lot of coding and programs like the Hidden Genius Project to really change the game. I live in South Vallejo, so it's ghetto every day. A lot of people stand outside, and I choose to code and come to Hidden Genius because I want to get away from it. With this app, I think we can, you know, modify our choices, make better decisions, and maybe in the future, I think we can change the world with this game. Thank you. And that was KQED's Arthi Shahani reporting. Joining me now for a look at other news we're tracking is Scott Schaefer. Hi, Scott. Hi, Tui. So uh, Jerry Brown made it official this week, filed papers to run for re-election. No surprise there. What kind of race do you think he'll have what, uh, between now and November? He's in great shape. Uh, he has $17 million in the bank. He's running against two relatively unknown Republican opponents uh, who don't have money and don't have name ID. He's presided over a, a recovering economy, a balanced budget. Uh, he's well known and his Poll numbers are good, so it would in, it would seem that uh, Jerry Brown is really going to cruise to re-election come November. But of course, it doesn't always work that way in terms of the conventional wisdom playing out. What are some of the things that could trip him up? Because it seems like he's sort of hit that sweet spot right now. He's fiscally tight, but liberal on uh, social justice issues. Yeah, I think you know the, probably the main concern would be his age. He turned 76 uh, in April. Uh, he had a battle with uh, skin cancer on his nose a couple few years ago. Now that seems to be gone. But there's always that unforeseen thing out there. And I think probably if you ask them privately, they would say that's, that would be the biggest concern if something like that were to happen and you know, raise questions about his ability to serve. Uh, Governor Brown will also have an appointment to the state Supreme Court soon. Justice Joyce Kennard is retiring. Uh, how will that tie into this election year for him? And also new statistics came out on the ethnic makeup of the court today. That's right. And uh, judges in California, although it's getting more diverse, still two-thirds male and white. Uh, the state Supreme Court has four Asian Americans and a majority of women, but no Latino judges and no African Americans. So you can be sure the pressure will be on the governor to appoint one of those uh, justices, African-American or Latino, and he'll have a great opportunity to do that uh, in the coming weeks. But from a gender perspective, about 45 percent of his appointments have been women? Yes, he's done well in terms of that, but, you know, there's a lot of judges. His appointments, you know, kind of have an impact gradually, uh, but, it, uh, but still just 32 percent of the judges are women, and uh, mm. it's changing, but slowly. Okay, slow progress. Thank you, Scott. You bet. And for all of KQED's news coverage, please go to kqednews.org. I'm Scott Schaefer. Thanks for joining us. And I'm Tui Vu. Have a good night.